Kishore, thank you for those kind words. Uh, I have not been in Singapore for maybe two, three years now, and this city just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, one of the differences, you create land. We are stuck with what we have, but I'm gonna go back and say, maybe we could fill in the East River. <laughs> Anyways, I wanted to thank the Republic of Singapore for its warm hospitality. You know, Singapore is in many ways just like New York City. Both are crossroads of commerce and homes to many cultures. Both are energetic, restless, forward-looking, constantly in motion, constantly rebuilding themselves, and constantly questioning and complaining and demonstrating and <laughs> demanding more. Uh, that's what makes a society a society. That's what makes a city more than just concrete. Um, in the uh, spirit, a uh, famous American writer once captured when he joked about New York that it's a great place or will be a great place if they ever finish it. And uh, the truth of the matter is they're not going to finish it and they will not finish Singapore. And if they do, then we're in trouble. Uh, but as long as we keep growing, I think that these are the places where the best and the brightest are going to want to live and where we're all going to want to raise our families. Singapore has the same uh, vigorous, dynamic outlook that New York has, as well as a strong commitment to sustainability that can be traced to the leadership of the remarkable man for whom this prize is named, uh, former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. I had dinner with uh, Mr. Liu, Mr. Um, Lee um, three months ago, maybe, in, uh, in Connecticut, right near New York City. And if I had known then that we were going to win the prize named after him, I uh, might have uh, said thank you back then, but uh, didn't know. I think uh, the last time I was here might have been actually, uh, I certainly was here in 05 for a meeting for the International Olympic Committee. Uh, they were deciding where to hold the 2012 Summer Games. Uh, New York was a finalist. Uh, we lost, however. London won. Congratulations to them. But, I don't really mean that, but that's okay. <laughs> well, we didn't want to win. Uh, but now, the truth of the matter is, with this wonderful prize, I think that New York has truly won the gold medal. So thank you once again. We really are proud of you. Um, Mr. Lee is one of those people that uh, I've said to my children, someday you're going to be able to say that your father knew Mr. Lee. And I think there are people in the world that uh, you're going to look back and say they were those transformative people that really changed not just their countries, but changed society. And uh, Lee Kuan Yew is one of those. Now, in the Olympics, uh, or in any major competition, no one wins by his or her efforts alone. And that was certainly true for this World City Prize. Teamwork really has been the key to realizing projects that have been acknowledged in winning us this prize. So let me salute first some of the members of New York City's team whose work has made these, project become, these projects become realities. There is the New York City Department of Transportation and its commissioner, Jeanette Setakan, who has made New York City's streets safer for pedestrians, motorists, and cyclists than they've ever been since records have been kept, and no small part to the projects that we celebrate today. Uh, she is one of these visionaries. When she came to me one day and said, we're going to close 10 blocks of Broadway, the main street through New York City, if you'll agree to it, I thought to myself, this woman is crazy. <laughs> but the more I listened to her, the more I thought that she was way ahead of me. She had a brilliant idea. She had a great rationale. And we have to try new things. Turns out that this was a great success. Not everything you try is going to be a success. And in fact, when you find something that's not a success, if you let that beat you, if you let that, you, it makes you stop trying, then all is lost. You have to keep going. And if you don't have a failure every once in a while, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, we have a parks department uh, headed by uh, Commissioner Adrian Benepe. Uh, he operates the biggest and, most, uh, muni and best most municipal park system in the United States and now it's help, uh, helping create some of the most imaginative and exciting new parks anywhere in the world. Our Department of City Planning and its director, Amanda Burden, who is right here, 
uh, with us, uh, have uh, overseen the most extensive reshaping of our, our city in more than 60 years. It is a process that will set the uh, standard for development and make development possible, uh, make our city more economically competitive, more attractive, more affordable uh, for an ethnically and economically diverse population and also more sustainable. And uh, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, the efforts of our city planning department will still be dictating how our city develops. And the efforts of these departments and of dozens of other city agencies as well are all blended to achieve the goals of what we call Plan YC. It is our action-oriented agenda for creating a greener, greater New York, an agenda overseen by my Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. And such long-term planning really is vital in New York City and in every other city as well. Because, um, as Kishore said, half, more than half the world's population is now living in cities, and three-quarters of them will be living in cities by the mid-century. Cities around the globe, including New York, must confront all of the effects of rapid urban growth in transportation, in housing, public health, public safety, education, and so many other areas. And we have to work to enhance what gives city life its zest. Attractive public parks, innovative public plazas, exciting public art, and by doing so, we can, as we've demonstrated in New York, I think, reclaim outdated and derelict infrastructure elements for recreational use. And such projects can also become catalysts for private sector investment, creating jobs and producing greater prosperity for all of our people. So let me just take a few minutes to turn briefly to each of these of three demonstration projects that I think rightly caught the attention of the judges in this year's Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize competition uh, because of the way that they are accomplishing these goals. The first is Brooklyn Bridge Park. New York, as you may know, is a city of five sub-districts, or boroughs as we call them. With some two and a half million people, Brooklyn is the most heavily populated of our boroughs. It used to be a separate city, but merged with New York City many years ago. In fact, if it was still a separate city, which it was until 1898, it would itself be the fourth biggest city in the United States. Brooklyn Bridge Park, the first portion of which opened two years ago, is one of the most significant new parks to be developed in Brooklyn in some 140 years. And just as importantly, it's one of the most innovative parks created in any city in recent years. And here's what I mean by when I say that. Traditionally, City parks have attempted to remove park, goer, grow, park goers from the hustle and bustle of urban life. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge Park does something radically different. It brings park users right to the edge of the greatest, busiest harbor in the world, framed by Manhattan's dramatic skyline and by the classic elegance of the world-famous Brooklyn Bridge itself. It gives them a front row seat to take it all in as well as a wide variety of ways to enjoy themselves at the harbor's edge. And it's doing that by creatively reusing what had become relics of Brooklyn's maritime past. Six abandoned piers along nearly a mile and a half of the borough's East River shore, once they were a thriving waterfront working to take in cargo for the city, but a cargo ship hasn't docked in them in more than a quarter of a century. And the slide you're looking at gives you an idea of what this place looked like just three years ago. And this shows you what the same spot looks like today. Now, I could easily spend the rest of my time today describing, describing all of the striking and subtle ways that the design of the park accentuates this theme of adoptive reuse, the way it captures stormwater to irrigate its landscape, or the way materials are found on site that were recycled for use in the park, let me just summarize by saying that Brooklyn Bridge Park, the rest of which will be built out over the next few years, succeeds spectacularly in realizing a new vision of what a park in an intensely urban setting can be. The same can be said enthusiastically about a second project for which we have been awarded the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize, the High Line. The High Line was an elevated railway running about a mile and a half along Manhattan's west side. Once it served warehouses and industries in this area, which is still referred to as the Meatpacking District, even though today 
there are more painters and software engineers than butchers. Like the pier we just described on the Brooklyn waterfront, however, the High Line hasn't been a working rail line since 1980. After decades of dis disuse, the opinion of many was that the High Line was an eyesore and that was, it was imp impeding the area's redevelopment and had to be torn down and the sooner the better. Incredibly, when our administration took office back in 2002, it was just a single court decision away from demolition. Thankfully, a different vision for the future of the High Line prevailed. And through a combination of private activism and funding and public investment and zoning action, the High Line has now been reborn as New York's first aerial park. And to quote the architecture critic Paul Goldberger, quote, walking on the High Line is unlike any other experience in New York. You float about 25 feet above the ground, at once connected to street life and far away from it, unquote. Like the Brooklyn Bridge Park, the High Line plunges visitors into the very heart of a dense urban environment. Like Brooklyn Bridge Park, it also reclaims an artifact of the city's recent industrial past and reinvents it for the 21st century. Now, none of this would have been possible without the ingenuity of a rezoning that gave property owners under the High Line value for their land. It convinced them that far from being a blight, a redesigned High Line could become the organizing principle of a new neighborhood. And that has, in turn, catalyzed some $2 billion in private sector investment, transforming this neighborhood into one of the hottest stretches of real estate in the entire city. The third of the three projects that I want to talk about has earned New York the World City Prize, in that, that has earned the, New York, the World City Prize, involves repurposing the public right of way. In other words, our new approach to bringing much of our 10,000 kilometers of streets and roadways for use by more people. It's based on our administration's strong commitment to dramatically sinking, shrinking the city's carbon footprint, to clearing our air of the harmful, harmful pollutants produced by auto exhaust, and also to encouraging a safe and more vibrant street life. For those reasons, we've begun redesigning roadways to provide greater space and safety to travelers who aren't in cars, specifically to cyclists and to pedestrians. Bicycling has become increasingly popular in New York. In fact, the number of New Yorkers who bicycle to work and school has doubled since 2007 and quadrupled in the past 10 years. And we expect the number of cyclists on our streets to continue growing in part because later this year we'll inaugurate the largest bike sharing program in the Americas. To increase safety for cyclists, since 2007 we've installed more than 430 kilometers of bike lanes in our city. We have, for example, established the first protected bike lanes in the United States. They move cyclists out of harm's way, putting them between street and curbs and a new parking lane for cars. And because some auto lanes were narrowed in the process, drivers are more cautious, increasing traffic safety for everyone. We've also reclaimed more public right-of-ways for pedestrians. The most celebrated example is our famous Times Square, which I mentioned earlier, which on average now has more than 365,000 people use it every single day. Traditionally, Pedestrians only had about 11% of the available public space, even though they comprised 86% of the traffic. This created an unbearable crush on the sidewalks and also a big spillover of pedestrian in, pedestrians into some of the city's busiest streets. And that contributed to a level of traffic injuries and fatalities more than 50% greater than on nearby streets and avenues. So three years ago, we took the somewhat controversial step of closing the major roadway through Times Square, our Broadway, to auto traffic. Was it controversial? You've never seen anything like it. <laughs> On the other hand, you've also never seen anything like the results. Traffic in the entire area now moves more smoothly. Pedestrians, who now have more than 41% new space available in Times Square, are far safer. It's also now an exciting new public space where only congestion and chaos existed before, a big plus for everyone. That includes economic benefits because the new Times Square Plaza, like the High Line, has greatly increased property values. 
In fact, since 2009, rents for street-level stores along the plaza have actually doubled, despite the effects of the national recession. And Times Square was recently named one of the top 10 retail locations in the world. And Times Square is only the tip of the iceberg. We have 50 new neighborhood plazas in development throughout the five boroughs that will transform underused local streets into vibrant public spaces. As I said earlier, all three of these projects are elements in our far-reaching Plan YC agenda for a greater, greener New York City. Implementing that agenda also includes everything from developing thousands of new apartments as well as new parks on formerly industrial sites in the city's 520 miles of waterfront, some of it completed, some of it still to come. It includes continuing to improve the quality of our waterways, already cleaner than they've been in a century, so that they become more inviting resources for recreation and also a home for the wildlife that reminds us that as humans, we share this environment with other living things. And we're making New York City an even more public transit oriented city than we already are by making our city's bus systems faster and more efficient and along several corridors showing how streets can safely and harmoniously accommodate buses, bikes, cars, and pedestrians. We're also funded from the city's own treasury the first major extension in decades to New York City's famous subway system, a project that will transform the last major underdeveloped stretch of Manhattan into a new large transit-oriented business and re residential development. It will accomplish this for this it will accomplish for this district what the extension of London's underground did for the now bustling Canary Wharf area in London. We've also initiated more new public spaces such like those that I've described today. Projects that not only create a more environmentally sustainable New York, but that also make our city more livable, more attractive, more exciting, and more economically competitive. All these cutting-edge projects add to New York City's reputation for creativity and innovation. They make us a place where people want to come, especially people who are creative and innovative themselves. Talented people who want to live in the cities that not only give them the greatest opportunity, but also offer the best quality of life. Earlier this month, the Economist Intelligence Unit of The Economist magazine published an exhaustive study on global city competitiveness. It named New York City number one in the world, just narrowly ahead of London and then Singapore. The, talented of, the talent of our people, the study said, is what gives us our competitive edge. The projects like the ones you've honored us for today, as well as the ones that we've given you a brief glimpse of just now, bring talented people to New York and convince them to stay. And because that's what's going to give our city a bright future in the decades to come, and because we hope that our example inspires other cities to become more sustainable and living, livable as well. On behalf of our administration and the 8.4 million people of the city of New York, I am honored to accept this prestigious prize. Once again, we could not be more honored than by the people of Singapore to receive this prize. Thank you all, and come to New York. We'd love to have you as visitors.